Hello and welcome to another episode of the Construction Corner Podcast. I'm Dylan. I'm your host. Guys, we're, we don't have a guest today, but before I get into it, so Matt and I come, come to you every week, talk about things that are relevant within the industry, talk about, frankly, what needs to be talked about. And, you know, our mission here is to build a great America, whether we're building it or designing it on our own end, or for you guys to do you know, a better job, right? I hate going down the street and seeing buildings that look like shit for no good reason, frankly. And I mean, I hope you all appreciate, you know, good architecture, good design, good building as you you go through really anywhere in the world. But our mission here is to help you build better and build a great America. And with that, you know, we don't always talk about nice things, easy things, things that people want to hear about. And uh, we were uh, kind of shooting the shit before this show and just finally decided to hit record on what we're talking about. And we're going to just dive right into it. But if you like this show, if you want us to be the loudmouths to uh, tell your friends what you've been saying all along, uh, please go ahead, share the show. Uh, we appreciate it. And we, again, we don't do this for, for money, for notoriety, for fame. It's all to help you guys uh, become better in the construction industry. Again, designers, owners, architects, engineers, contractors, subs, everybody. Uh, and with that, the thing that we're talking about is throughout the industry, there's people that do, they go above and beyond, right? They do do a great job. They try to do the right thing. And more often than not, they get shit on for frankly, no good reason. Maybe not a reason somebody understands. And you know, Matt, you can jump in here at any point, but this is, you know, I think the, the big thing that it ruins so many people within our industry, it beats them down and you just kind of become lethargic on the topic because you're just like, why does it even matter anymore? And that's a bad stance to be in. It's a really bad place, um, but it happens, it happens to the best of us. It does because we allow for so much mediocrity all across the board, right? From designers to specifiers, to suppliers, to builders, to subcontractors, and to owners and clients also. We allow mediocrity at all levels. And it takes the, the guy or the, or the girl, the man or the woman who's really stretching and really going above and beyond to produce a great product and to really produce the best for their client, whoever that client is. And it beats them down because you can fight as hard as you can all day long, all week long. And all it takes sometimes is that one asshole <laughs> to, to come back and, and flip the script on you. And, you know, people have a hard time coming back from that. And it's so easy to just sit in the corner, be a part of the gray, right? And, and never riff, never ripple the water, never, never ruffle up the, the rug. Uh, and people will almost be forced into that. If, if you don't have that mentality of constant fight and constantly trying to improve and to grow and to better every day, most people will slide off into that corner, never to be seen again. I mean, guys, think of it this way. So you've got your standard project. Let's say you go above and beyond, right? You maybe do a little more for a given milestone deliverable. You bust ass and uh, on the field and you, you get a an extra room done that day, right? You really just kicked ass and got more shit done. But because of whatever reason, you get yelled at for going above and beyond, right? For doing more than you were paid for, which is a you know, golden rule, if you will, and uh, to go in and doing that extra work, but you get beat down, you get told like, hey, we don't do this. This isn't, you know, we don't go above. We just do what we're here to do because probably somebody's gotten chewed before or it came to bite them in the ass for whatever reason. But now you're basically being told, and this is a cultural problem throughout the industry that, hey, you doing more and better it's not good here. We don't like it. We're, we're not good with it. And because of that, so you never, maybe you try again next time, right? You try to do your best, do a great job, go above and beyond, you know, 
fix stuff that needs to be fixed, right? <laughs> Find a better tool, uh, change some processes, whatever, right? Fix the thing that you had problems with, go above and beyond, do it. And then again, you get chewed out for it for no good reason. The guy wasn't having a good day, but it, over and over and over again, this happens. And now you never want to go above and beyond again. You never want to do a great job again. And you get beat into mediocrity. You get beat into a submission basically of why should I care then? Why, why does this even matter? And that is a bad attitude straight up, but it's a cultural thing across the industry. Frankly, there's a lot of it in our country right now where people are getting beat into just not caring and it's a bad place to be. It's old school union mentality at its finest. And it's one of the reasons why the unions started to fall apart and, and lost their grasp on, on frankly, lots of industries. Um, automotive industry is a great example. The teachers union is a great example of one that <laughs> mediocrity, it, it, it doesn't even begin. It, it pales in comparison to the, the fluff and the gray that our, our teachers are now teaching. I, I can't get any farther on that topic because I'll, I'll lose my shit here. But in construction, you, you know, the, the unions allowed a lot of that to happen. They allowed that, that mediocre. They, they punished and frowned upon the guy doing more. So a lot of firms de-unionized. They took the risk. They paid their money. They got out. And it's not to say that we don't work with union shops. We do. Some of my favorite carpenters are still unionized. Our painter is still unionized. They're smaller shops and they, they found a way to keep culture high and to keep culture at the forefront of what they do. So their guys go out and bust ass and they produce and they really know how to play the game. But I would say 90% of our subcontractor partners that we, we team with are non-union. And it's because of that, that mediocrity that bred and, and infested the industry, you know, 20 plus years ago, whenever it was that it really became prevalent. And I, I don't know, man, I mean, it, I see it coming back. I see it in, in different sections and in different trades, especially you see it all over the news right now. Uh, if, if we, as an industry, allow ourselves to go and, and abolish say right to work laws, this industry is going to, it's in for a giant dumping. Like I don't think many people realize it's, it's going to bring that mediocre bullshit mentality flying back to the surface and, and we're all screwed for it. I mean, just think of the projects that are hard enough to get done today as it is, right? The, <clears throat> the jobs that, and this has been going on for a decade where you, you can't find work, you can't find people to produce the work, you can't find anybody to get it done, your subs, your suppliers, everybody up and down the entire supply chain is having problems in finding good people and getting it done. And you add now on top of that, a uh, culture and environment where it becomes difficult to even attract people into the industry, let alone good people man, like, why would you come into a, you know, what construction is a great industry. Why would you then come into a place where you're just going to get beat down, yelled at it, and no one is ever trying harder to get better, to improve, to find, you know, I mean, like productivity is the lowest in construction it's ever been. There's no investment in anything, which we've touched on in many episodes, you know, like most industries invest like four and a half percent in R and D constructions at like 1.2%. And most firms don't even invest that in their, their company. I mean, this is across the board, engineers, architects, and architects are some of the worst, like the ones still using AutoCAD that haven't, you know, come out of the dark ages. I mean, it's, it's affecting their business. They're not able to grow. And, but again, it's just how it's always been and settling for mediocrity versus allowing, you know, innovation to happen and just holding a higher standard. I've run into this on so many projects here lately where uh, people, frankly, just don't care. 
uh, and it trickles all the way through the project. Like if nobody really cares or holds a line for it, well, you know, why, why should I, right? If you get beat down on a project, okay. Like again, it's not mine, right? But, and that's, it's tough when that happens on many projects, you just, it gets apathetic and nobody delivers. And then you wonder why the project turns out the way it does at the end of the day, when it could have been great if, you know, some standards and lines were held at the top, right? At the owner level, at the, you know, from the beginning of the project before you got into the rest of it. It comes down to a topic we've frequented on this show and that's, you gotta be willing to have the difficult uncomfortable conversations because nothing changes if you don't if we just keep blindly letting things happen to us well look at where we are right now <laughs> you know it, we we allow so much to be taken for granted and, and we allow so many times to think that everyone else has our best interest in mind at all times and you know Politically speaking, I'm not, not even going there, but now more than ever, we're seeing that's not the case. And, it, and it's not the case in construction. It's not the case in medicine. It's not the case in politics. It's not the case in absolutely anything outside of maybe the parent and child relationship. You know, it just isn't. People all want what's best for them. We're all selfish by nature. So if you can't have the difficult conversations up front and make sure that the people who are working for you or with you or whatever are, are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And if you don't agree with it, you challenge it. If you can't do that, we just allow ourselves to keep digging this perpetual hole. And I've got thousands of examples. I, I'm on a project right now that we have busted our ass for the last year to keep this project afloat. We broke ground in I don't know, whenever the snow went away, May, June. And, and, but for the last year, year and a half, we've, we've struggled, we've fought, we've made insane negotiations and deals with our suppliers and, and vendors to keep pricing that, frankly, we, we offered up a year ago. That's unheard of. And without getting into too many of the details and giving away this, <laughs> the project, there were things that, that took place on the design side where the owner didn't ask the right questions. He just assumed that this guy, this designer he hired was absolutely working in his best interest. And I can tell you that absolutely did not happen. The guy is, is overpaying immensely for the product he's trying to bring to market. And it all could have been solved by just asking those questions and by having the uncomfortable conversation, pushing back when, when you need to push back. And instead he didn't, he kind of rolled over when he was asked to roll over and it's just, it's a bad scenario to be a part of it. It sucks to watch I mean, we'll build it. It'll be a great building. It'll be, it'll stand for, you know, 50, 60 years, whatever. But I know we could have done it better had we been involved in a different capacity because I would have pushed back. I would have asked those questions to the people that were, sketching and drawing this thing i would have i don't have any problem being the asshole <laughs> i don't i don't like to hang my hat on that but sometimes you have to be i mean so my uh my in-laws were out here this last week they're designing a house building a house out here in california and in that they've hired an architect right residential architect to do it that was assigned by the uh, kind of subdivision, right, that they're in that you had to use this architect to to build it. And then, you know, they've had a falling out with the first builder because the guy never responded to an email. Uh, contractor just never, never got back to him or one of those like, oh, yeah, I'm getting around to it type of things. Uh, I never did. So uh, they, they finally found somebody that was good at it, but they were doing site walks. So, you know, slabs poured, framing's going up and they had, you know, like side lights uh, around their fireplace and some other like transom stuff. And they were walking it with the architect and the architect pointed out like, hey, you know, they're missing this, like it's not framed properly, which that happens. Like, you know, it, it, <laughs> anybody can miss anything. Uh, and, it's, you know, not 
I mean, it's their fault, but it's not like a problem, right? Caught it early. It's still in framing. We could fix it. And the architect was like, oh no, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything. Uh, it's, uh, I don't want to bring it up. It's, you know, not, and then, you know, my in-laws brought it up to their builder, like, Hey, you know, we noticed this where, you know, this wasn't framed properly. And he's like, oh yeah, no, our, we'll take care of that. Like, it's, it's not a big deal. Right. Like they're like, oh yeah, no, that's right. Okay, cool. Um, but far too often, right. That, that architect didn't bring it up and that's a problem. But also in that relationship, they're not contractually obligated to do that either. And not that this should be a contract thing, but it's it just goes to show that somebody who's been 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 beaten down for long enough won't ever raise anything when it's an actual problem, you know, and knows that it's a problem, knows it wasn't done correctly, and you know that type of thing just perpetuates through everything else. And it, it stops people from just doing the right thing because we all know that's that's the easiest way to solve all of our problems is just do the right thing all the time. But it stops people from doing that. Like this architect, you know, it, it doesn't do any good for the industry. It doesn't do any good for us as a society as a whole. I don't know how far, how far down that rabbit hole to go, but it's just, it permeates everything. Well, and it's one of those things of like, why did I even hire an architect, right? So from, from the design community, right, in this side of it, it's, you hear those stories far too often, right, of somebody who was hired to, you know, basically design, build a custom home, right, or design a custom home for somebody. And, like, you know, it's for anybody building a home, more than likely it's not a small investment to them, right? It's very personal. It's especially homes, right? It's a very personal thing. It's your own taste, all this stuff. And then for somebody to just not care, right? At the same level that, that you do is just, it's so disheartening and it's problematic on a lot of, on a lot of ways, but this gives the design community such a bad name to where, especially in residential, where you want people to care to the level that you are for the thing that is so much, you know, and it could vary in scale, right? So someone's half a million dollar home or $200,000 home to someone's half a million to someone's $20 million house, right? There's equal amount of care in each of those for, for the given person. And for the design professional to not give a shit is it just shits on everybody through the industry. Yeah. And it's, it's not just the design guys. I, I give them a hard time and we butt heads all the time, but I mean, that's the mentality that gives construction the shit name that it sometimes has, right? It's, it's permeates everything. The GC, the subs, everybody's out to screw everyone else and, and make a fast buck. And, you know, that, those stereotypes were founded in truth, right? Or at least in partial truth, I should say. There's bad apples in every bunch, but I think a lot of it is, it just, it's a systemic problem as a society that we have allowed to fester and to grow unchecked for years and years and years. And here's the thing, right? On the other side of that, if you care, if you actually do a good job, if you actually respond in a timely fashion, if you do a lot of the things that we talk about here on the show, you would have a great business, right? It would grow. It would be profitable. Just like my in-laws, they went from a builder who never answered an email to a guy who was on it and got him permits within, you know, 30 days, right? It's a completely different ball game for a guy that had a year and didn't do anything to somebody that was like handled it and handled it in a very timely fashion, you know, and it makes all the difference. You know, that guy's business is growing. The other one is not. It's real simple. Yeah. And, and that first guy who, who shit the bed is going to get weeded out. And eventually, eventually that guy will be out of a, out of a company, out of a project, out of a, a job, whatever it may be. We just need to, we need to start making these decisions and, and forcing, forcing the bad apples off the tree sooner. Yeah. And I mean, so changing gears a little bit, you know, 
from this guys like look it's not rocket science but the the gear change is through a lot of this you know there's a lot of construction firm owners that are that are doing what they feel is the right thing and taking on projects at super thin margins less than the typical one to five ten percent they're typically taking on projects but even slimmer margins are even at a loss to just keep everybody busy, right? And trying to do the right thing and keep their guys employed, keep cash flow moving. And while that's honorable, it's only gonna, it's a short-term solution. And it's again, not willing to have the conversations with your owners, with your developers on, look, prices are not the same they were yesterday, let alone three weeks ago, let alone six months ago. So, you know, we need to have a different discussion here to remain profitable. So I can be here when you do have a warranty issue in 18 months and I'm not out of business. Like that's a real conversation that I don't think enough people are actually having uh, in this type of market where prices are changing because they don't want to. And instead of taking it on, they're taking it on the chin instead of, you know, redressing what it actually costs. And that's a horrible way to do business, but that's a reality. I see it all the time. I see it every day. You know, you can't, it's, it's a scary conversation to go back to someone and say, Hey, by the way, that number I told you six months ago, we're 75% higher than that now because of commodity pricing. You know, you and I will understand that we'd be like, Oh shit, is that all? Well, okay. That makes sense. It sucks, but let's, let's move on to the next day but people who aren't in it and don't see it they don't understand that that combined with these ridiculous lead times and, and lack of material availability it's very difficult and it's becoming more and more difficult by the day to have to 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 educate our consumers our clients for what is really going on out there you know i tell people all the time as a general contractor i don't make prices i don't I don't price this building. All I do is tell you what the market has priced your building at. Now, I like to think that my team, we do it in a way that's much better than everyone else around, you know, and, and then we build it more efficiently and, and in a better way and, and all these great things. But realistically, the market tells us what the building costs. So it's my job now to educate my prospect, my prospective clients on what the market's telling us. And then we all have to sit down and have that hard conversation to make an educated decision. Do we push on forward at these numbers at this rate and, and this level of, or lack of level of availability? Do we put it on hold and wait six months and come back and, and revisit? Or do we just scrap it, you know, broom it off and be done? And, you know, I'm having those conversations almost every day lately, it seems. But that's just a fact of life right now. And if you don't have them, because I'll, I'll fight tooth and nail for my, my people, my team to keep them working. But it, you know, at a certain point, you, you reach that fault level where it's catastrophic, it's cannibalistic, and you can't sustain it. I'd much rather have the uncomfortable, shitty conversation now and preserve the good for later if if we can do that and it's having those conversations you know what are your options and you've got to think through those you know on the design side we have these all the time where you know hey you've got a few options here take your pick right we don't i don't really care what you choose i just need to know what we're going to do moving forward right we can do it one, two, or three ways, whatever it might be, and move forward. And we just need to have more and more of those conversations. It's ultimately it's the owner's responsibility for that project. You know, what do you want? How are we going to move forward? Is this something that you're going to do, not do? How do you want to do it? You know, we're we're good on, <laughs> you know, really whatever uh, side and way that you want to move forward. But it's you got to have those conversations. Um, try to have them in small chunks, right? You don't want to like go into this, not having had a lot of hard conversations before 
and have the really big one, even though sometimes that might be required, but to, to have some tougher, smaller conversations to where it's, you realize it's not the end of the world. Things aren't going to implode. You know, you can move on and, and live another day. And I think we need to, again, spend some time thinking about this, not jump from one fire to the next, not go off on an emotional rip uh, for, even though we all get there sometimes on, on that next thing to do, but it's also to, to know your numbers, to know your options, and then present those options to, you know, especially again, in, in the building world and the construction world that we live in, that is the thing you've got to be able to do is have hard conversations, but know the options to take, you know, left, right, or we just go home. That, that's it, man. I, I got nothing else. That's, that's where we're at. You got to, you got to have the hard conversations. You got to have the knowledge. You got to be constantly pushing to get better every day, fighting off that, that gray cloud of mediocrity that's, that's infecting so much. That's how we come out of this prosperous and, and we build our industry and our, and our damn country back to what it should be. And through that guys, like if you are good, if you are confident in what you can deliver, if you know that you have a great product, a great team, a great everything about you charge for it do not be afraid to charge more for your services this is the other thing in the death spiral that's been happening to construction for a long time is everyone's gotten beat down on prices right you've been beat down on your services on design it's been neglected you know when a good design can save a lot of money on the building right so if you are good if you are great at what you do do not be afraid to charge more People don't accept it. You can be okay with, or learn to be okay with that, right? And being able to explain the value and why your services are necessary. And this goes for everybody, right? Up and down the chain. If you're able to deliver a project faster as a sub consultant, that adds a lot of value to the project, right? If you can do that as a general contractor and save money and expedite and your scheduling and everything else, financing is better than everybody else. Don't be afraid to charge more for it. You know, this has become a commoditized industry and that hurts everybody. Couldn't agree more, man. All right, guys, this is a short episode. We, uh, there's just a lot of bullshit going on in the, <laughs> the country, the world right now. And, um, you know, we'll have more to say on it, but we wanted to talk about some of these things that we feel are, you know, important to talk about and, not being afraid to, to charge for it, not being afraid to have hard conversations, to communicate effectively with your clients. You know, at the end of the day, we want everybody to win. We want everybody to be great. We want great buildings, great projects, great owners, great everybody. And it's been so systemic through the industry on just getting beat down for doing more, um, you know, sometimes for not doing enough, but more often than not, it's like, we didn't, you know, you did more and that's, that's not good. Um, and that needs to stop. And again, it's just setting expectations, having hard conversations, trying to set some ground rules, if you will, for each project and then moving forward from there. Uh, so if you like this show, if you like what we're talking about, leave us a review, leave us some comments, guys. We would love to talk more about these, these things. We're willing to have the hard conversations. This probably does me no good but I'm willing to, to do it because I think it's the right thing to do. And that's this episode of the Construction Corner Podcast. Until next time.